As quantum computing becomes more of a reality, we review a pivotal technology that launched superconducting qubits further into the spotlight. My name is Will Chan, and this is the Trans1 qubit. DiVincenzo in 2000 summarized the required criteria for quantum computing as five key points. Firstly, a scalable physical system with well characterized qubits. Secondly, the ability to initialize the state of the qubits to a simple state. Long and relevant co decoherence times, much longer than the gate operation time. A universal set of quantum gates, in just saying unitary operations can be performed in finite time. And a qubit specific measurement capability. There are two additional requirements for quantum communication the ability to interconvert stationary and flying qubits, and the ability to faithfully transmit flying qubits between specified locations. Superconducting qubits are defined as collective excitations in superconducting circuits. These superconducting qubits are arguably the leading candidate in quantum computation architecture. For scalable quantum computing, we look to satisfy DiVincenzo's criteria. Specifically, we want sufficient control over a well-defined qubit and low noise, among other things. Superconducting qubits are indeed well-defined and lead the way as an approach that realizes quantum logic elements and coherent interaction in a highly controlled and low-noise way. Given recent work in this area, superconducting qubits are demonstrative of noisy intermediate-scale quantum computing, or NISC, which we can see on the right of this diagram. This has the potential to outperform classical computers. These superconducting qubits have also provided some of the first implementations of multiple qubit gates on logical error-corrected qubits. These two major tracks of work are NISC and fault-tolerant quantum computing. To talk about superconducting circuits and qubits, we need to understand Joseph's injunctions and Cooper pairs. Cooper pairs form when two electrons with roughly equivalent and opposite momentum are bound together via phonon interactions. As one electron attracts positively charged phonons along its trajectory, this wave-like movement of phonons can attract electrons at longer ranges, creating this effective attraction between electrons. Treating these interacting electrons as effectively a single boson, we get a Cooper pair. Joseph's injunctions consist of two superconductors divided by an insulating wall. Cooper pairs can actually tunnel through this insulating barrier without a drop in the voltage across the junction as a whole. This defines a supercurrent uh, super or tunneling current, I. The phase difference delta defined between the two superconductors is shown here, where I0 is a critical supercurrent. In 1988, Clark and their team demonstrated that this phase difference is actually a quantum variable, behaving as some quasi-particle or wave packet in a tilted washboard potential that can tunnel to quantized energy levels. It is indeed possible with sufficient resources to isolate this degree of freedom for use as a quantum bit. These Joseph's injunctions have been implemented to form various types of qubit, namely the charge, flux, and phase qubits. Let's discuss one of these examples, the charge qubit. Take a Joseph's injunction and use it to connect a nanoscale superconducting electrode to a reservoir. This creates what we call a Cooper pair box. The Cooper pair box is an artificial two-level system where the levels correspond to different charge states, hence defining a charge qubit as these states can be superposed. Nakamura and team in 1999 demonstrated that the Cooper pair box state evolution could be controlled in a coherent manner. So why is this a two-level system? There are a large number of electrons in the metal box electrode which form Cooper pairs under superconductivity, representing a single ground state of n Cooper pairs. The low energy excitations all arise due to Cooper pair tunneling through the Josephson junction. If our charging energy, EC, is greater than the Josephson energy and thermal energy as shown here, we create an effective two-level system by taking the lowest two energy states, which are typically only separated by a single Cooper pair. As the energy gap of these two lowest energy states can be controlled by the voltage across the Josephson junction, we have a two-level system with coherent control. And while this is an excellent candidate for a qubit in some quantum computing application, it is in fact hindered by decoherence. The main source of Cooper pair box decoherence at the time of this paper by Nakamura was thought to be the spontaneous emission of a photon. So these implementations of the Joseph's injunction to form superconducting qubits have great potential for scaling due to photo and electron beam lithography. 
but coherence times in the early 2000s were simply insufficiently large enough to perform error correction and scalable quantum computation. So how could we look to tackle this? One approach is to improve the properties of the Josephson junction and materials to eliminate sources of one over F noise. Another would be to eliminate linear noise sensitivity using sweet spot operations, in essence, just tailoring the quantum circuit to boost performance. Now into the transmon in 2007. Of the two approaches mentioned earlier, the transmon definitely aligns more with the second. The transmon qubit or transmission line shunted plasma oscillation qubit is a type of superconducting qubit derivative of the Cooper pair box, but operating in a regime of a much higher ratio of Josephson energy and charging energy, EJ over EC. What we achieve from this is reduced charge noise sensitivity without significant loss of anharmonicity. Why is this the case? As the ratio increases, the charge dispersion is decreasing exponentially with respect to EJ over EC, and a high charge dispersion means more charge noise that the qubit is exposed to. However, the anharmonicity which we want to preserve is only decreasing algebraically with respect to this ratio. So we can bring down the charge dispersion quite significantly whilst preserving this anharmonicity property sufficiently enough to make sure that transitions between the lowest two energy states, as shown on the left here, are still unique and not affecting transitions of higher, higher energy level states. The transmon architecture consists of two Josephson junctions that are being shunted by some additional capacitance CB. The shunt capacitance is then matched by a gate capacitance CG, as shown on the diagram. This is, this is an example of a DC squared architecture, allowing the Josephson energy EJ to be tuned by an external magnetic flux. This just means that the superconducting quantum interference device, or squid, consists of a superconducting closed loop interrupted by two Josephson junctions. We also define the effective Hamiltonian, as shown here on the right, where N sub G is the effective offset charge on the device in units of Cooper pair charge. The shunting is the key difference here between the transmon and the Cooper pair box, and it allows us to operate in this regime with EJ much greater than EC. We can see in the simplified schematic diagram of the transmon qubit that a split Cooper pair box is used. But unlike the original approach, there is a section of transmission line shunting the box formed by extending the superconducting islands of the qubit. It's worth taking a closer look at the unharmonicity picture below. As we increase the ratio of EJ to EC, we move away from this ratio being unity, in which there are degenerate energy levels, towards one where the transmon value um, for EJ over EC is above 50. And we can see that we're getting more and more distinct separation of the energy levels. This is ideal because we want to have these distinct lower energy levels for the transmon to behave like a two level system. Note that there's still some remaining anharmonicity maintained even where the ratio reaches 50. In direct comparison to the Cooper bear box, we can see that the T2 time for the transmon is significantly outperforming the CPB qubit with respect to charge noise sources, demonstrating this robustness that we claimed earlier. So what? How has the transmon qubit been implemented recently to push the field forward? Powerhouses in the quantum computing industry like Google have published several papers on quantum supremacy, topological quantum states, including anion braiding, braiding and logical qubit encoding, as well as quantum error correction. In 2019, Google claimed it had achieved quantum supremacy in a definitive manner. In this landmark paper, they reportedly deployed a programmable superconducting processor to create quantum states on 53 qubits for computation. This corresponds to 2 to the power of 53, or roughly 10 to 16 classical bits, and it is estimated a classical supercomputer at its best would take roughly 10,000 years to do the same task, which is impressive given the transmon based Sycamore processor used by Google would take about 200 seconds to perform this. The task in question was to sample the output of a pseudo random quantum circuit. Now, while this claim is yet to be formally disproved, some are skeptical that this is enough to claim quantum supremacy. It is widely agreed upon, however, that this is a huge step in advancing the next paradigm of quantum computing.
Let's also take a minute to review the current state of the art in the quantum computing world. In terms of the progress being made in developing new superconducting qubit candidates, there has also been a great deal of improvement from the coming of CPB up to the year 2020. Through several iterations of the transmon, the flux, fluxonium, and other qubit types, the lifetime that we achieve has come from nanosecond order to now approaching milliseconds. We can also see that bosonic encoded and error corrected qubits have begun to enter the field. From a broader industry lens, many entities are looking to enter what has been coined quantum readiness. Among several companies building and developing quantum technology, largely based on the transmon qubit, two frontrunners are setting a definitive pace in the market. In 2020, we saw the development of multi-qubit systems of order 10 to 20 qubits. However, IBM in 2022 raised that bar to 433 qubits in their IBM Osprey system. As stated earlier, Google claimed quantum supremacy in 2019, but has also since published further studies pertaining to graph theory, many body systems, and quantum error correction, among many other topics, through the use of quantum computation relying on the transmon qubit, even creating a new open source Python library to further this pursuit. It's worth noting that these processes are more applicable to the NISC era of quantum computation, in which we perform quantum algorithms and simulations in the absence of absolute quantum error correction whilst still achieving quantum advantage. So why don't we have working transmon-based quantum computers? This is by no means an exhaustive list, but a couple of the big ones include that we have yet to demonstrate logical states can be formed with longer lifetimes than their constituent physical um, states. We've also seen that transmon qubits were found to be sensitive to a phase transition in the many body localization or MVL regime in which these states can enter chaotic fluctuation. Looking forward with a functioning logical qubit that has a relevant decoherence time, the next step would certainly be to scale the system and sufficiently implement error correction. This will take significant advances in materials, fabrication and control but is currently at the forefront of what industry and academia are both trying to achieve.